us. We're going to give it a minute or two to let people in get settled in our virtual space here. So we will be beginning in just a moment. Looks like it's filling up quite quickly. That's great. Some interest here. Okay, I think I am going to begin. My name is Kelly Blahos, and I am a senior advisor at the Quincy Institute and editorial director for our online magazine, Responsible Statecraft. I am very proud to be moderating our discussion today of the 20th Party Congress, a day after its culmination, which was marked by dramatic personnel changes and what many have observed to be a clear consolidation of power by Chinese leader Xi Jinping. If you're not familiar with the Quincy Institute, we're a think tank dedicated to shifting the conversation in Washington away from military and militarized solutions to modern foreign policy problems towards common sense, restrained approaches, steeped in positive engagement and diplomacy. In other words, looking at the world as it is, not as we want it to be, and plotting out a course for security here at home and overseas that avoids zero-sum competition and great power conflict. So we have a lot to talk about today. Um, so I'd really like to get right into it. I am joined by two outstanding scholars in their respect respective fields of Chinese affairs and East Asian international relations. And we are very lucky to have them working on our team at the Quincy Institute. First, we have Michael Swain, the director of our East Asia program. Before coming to Quincy, he worked for nearly 20 years at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace as a senior fellow specializing in Chinese defense and foreign policy and US-China relations. He also served as a senior policy analyst at the RAND Corporation and has co-authored and edited more than a dozen books and monographs, including Remaining Aligned on the Challenges Facing Taiwan and Cooperation in the Asia Pacific Region, a Strategic Net Assessment, and has written many more journal articles and book chapters. Next, we have Jake Warner, who joined the Quincy Institute this summer as a research fellow in our East Asia program. Prior to joining QI, Jake was a postdoctoral global China, China research fellow at the Boston University Global Development Policy Center, a Harper Schmidt fellow at the University of Chicago, a Fulbright scholar at National Shaotung University in Taiwan, and a Fulbright Hayes fellow at East China Normal University in Shanghai. His writing has appeared in publications like Foreign Affairs, The Nation, Boston Review, and The Guardian. I'd also like to add that these scholars are doing a ton of work on this very topic for the Quincy Institute. In June, Michael published a brief entitled Active Denial, a roadmap to a more effective, stabilizing, and sustainable U.S. defense strategy in Asia. And he literally published a brief this morning entitled Ending the Destructive Sino-U.S. Interaction over Taiwan, a call for mutual reassurance. Meanwhile, Jake has an article in the current issue of The Nation contrasting the Russian and Chinese orientations to the world and why the U.S. shouldn't conflate the two, as well as a great interview on Radio Open Sources in Search of Monsters podcast on this topic. All can be found on the QI website at quincyinst.org. So, Clearly, we are talking to the right people here, and I'm eager to get their insights on what happened over the last week, particularly in the context of future U.S.-China relations with respect to Taiwan and security in the region, but also China's economic and political picture and what Xi's tightening grip on the party means for the nation and for its international relations moving forward. Okay, so let's start with you, Michael. Um, before we get to the meat and potatoes, it might be useful to establish what the party Congress is and why it's so important for us to understand the internal policy making, the leadership direction, and how this might play out in China's relations with its neighbors and the Western powers. Can you take a minute to lay this all out for us? Sure, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Kelly. Really a pleasure to be here with you and Jake and everybody else. Uh, well, the background of uh, the, the CCP Congress, the Congress of the Chinese Communist Party is a major meeting, uh, the major meeting of the party leadership that's held every five years. Um, it's critically important because it establishes the party leadership for the next five years, and it sets the general policy perspective of that leadership on political matters and broad policy issues. 
The Congress, therefore, provides uh, a clear indication of the power distribution within the leadership and the general approach to both foreign and domestic policies and the view of the overall foreign and domestic policy environment. Um, it's also important to note that the Party Congress is the first of two major meetings that occur every five years. The first is a Congress. It's followed then by the National People's Congress, which is held the following spring, usually in March. So March of 2023, we will be seeing the National People's Congress. It takes the decisions and the outlooks of the Party Congress as a foundation and names the top leaders of the government, the president, the premier, the members of the state council, et cetera, and it provides far more details on the specific foreign and domestic policy issues relevant to the government. So it's also a very important meeting. So people should be looking for that as well. And there'll be a series of meetings held between the party Congress and the National People's Congress. Um, and, and the first one was immediately after the party Congress, which named the members of the Politburo Standing Committee who were introduced um, our Sunday uh, yesterday. Great, so I think everyone here is wondering uh, what happened on Saturday with the 79-year-old ex-president Hu Xintao being escorted out of the party Congress, visibly disturbed, and the ensuing attempt at blacking out the news on social media shortly thereafter. Um, Jake, can you talk about this and what other personnel changes occurred at the Congress um, that would anticipate any new direction for Xi and the party? Neil Thomas of the Eurasia Group said, and I quote, China has entered a new era of maximum Xi, which means, quote, more support for Xi's policies, which means a stronger focus on political control, economic statism, and assertive diplomacy. Is, is this a good summation of the event and um, the policies that came out of it? And what does this mean for broader US-China relations? Okay, uh, thanks, Kelly. Um, uh, that's a bunch of questions. Uh, I have, I cannot unfortunately uh, share any particular insight on what happened with Hu Jintao, but it, it was a really exceptional episode in uh, in the sort of public theater of the Communist Party of China. Um, uh, Hu Jintao, of course, was the previous top leader uh, preceding Xi Jinping. Um, he was seated right next to Xi Jinping. Uh, at this uh, this key moment in the Congress, and all of a sudden he seemed to become confused or upset, um, and then uh, and then a couple of uh, a couple of attendants came to escort him out, uh, seemingly um, seemingly on against his will. Um, so I <clears throat> there's been a ton of speculation about what happened, um, whether it was an intentional kind of public humiliation of Hu Jintao uh, by Xi Jinping, uh, whether uh, and this is the explanation that was given on, on Chinese state media, um, that Hu Jintao was just sick and uh, confused, perhaps, the sort of an intimation that he, he was unwell, but had intended had insisted on attending the Congress. Um, uh, who knows? Um, but I, I think, I guess, uh, one, one point worth making is that it would be a little bit surprising to me if this was um, an intentional kind of stage man managed uh, hit on Hu Jintao to me because uh, because precisely because Xi Jinping is all about predictability and stability. Um, I think that's an important an important point to make just in general about Xi Jinping. Uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of I think sloppy analogies being made uh, between Xi Jinping and Mao Zedong. Uh, Mao Zedong embraced chaos. He he generated it. He pursued it. He used it to his advantage. Xi Jinping is quite the opposite. He, he wants to suppress any kind of disorder, um, any kind of uh, sort of, he, he is about regimentation. He is a, he is a bureaucrat's bureaucrat. Um, uh, so so I, I don't, I can't offer a, a conclusive uh, account there, but, but I think the one thing that it did really dramatically do is demonstrate how absolutely uh, Xi Jinping ran the board on the personnel changes that were announced um, yesterday. Uh, so um, uh, Saturday and yesterday. So this is both the central committee. Uh, apology. I don't. I'm not going to tr tr try not to get sunk in the morass here. But there's the central committee, which is uh, several hundred people. There's the Politburo, uh, which is uh, uh, 20, 24 people. 
And then there's the uh, Politburo Standing Committee, which is the sort of top uh, top body of the party that sets uh, sets direction for everything. And then, of course, Xi Jinping stands at the at the at the top of the Politburo Standing Committee. Um, so the personnel for the new this five year term uh, for all three of those was announced on Saturday and Sunday. And the outcome was uh, against the expectations of many people that there would be at least some integration for previous factions uh, aside from Xi Jinping's. Um, so, for example, Hu Jintao's faction, which is which is called the um, the Chinese Youth League faction, he had he had been the head of the Chinese Youth League and sort of built up his factional base within it. Um, that had been uh, the, the power of that faction had been eroding for many for many years under Xi Jinping. Um, but not even a single one of, uh, of the people who represent that sort of past part of the party in power uh, were included in, in this round of personnel changes. So it, it really was a, a striking demonstration um, uh, of how much power Xi Jinping has over the party now. The, the previous uh, sort of fractured, factionalized organization of power within the party has, has truly been swept aside. Um, all the people at the top of the, the party leadership are now Xi Jinping's men. Um, so that that is uh, probably the most significant and revealing outcome that, that we see in the party Congress. Wow. Um, so I guess my next logical question is how how do we see international relations uh, impacted uh, by these changes? So I guess I'm going to pose this question to both of you. Did the Party Congress provide any indication of how the party now sees China's international goals moving forward? The New York Times this morning said, quote, now having secured a precedent defying third term, Mr. Xi is posed to push his vision of a, quote, swaggering nationalist China even further with himself as the center. So is China poised to being more military aggressive, militarily aggressive? Is it presenting a program of eventual Chinese dominance over the global order? Or does it present China as attaining a leadership role in a multipolar world? And what are the main features of that role? Um, Michael, would you like to take this first? Sure. Um... There is, I think, a lot of continuity uh, in the party Congress with what has preceded it, as far as the international environment is concerned, as far as Chinese foreign policy is concerned, to the extent that it is addressed in the party Congress. Um, there are the standard statements made by the Chinese that they don't seek hegemony, they don't seek to have dominance in the world, uh, they're in support of a multipolar world, um, there's comments about having to improve China's image in the world, um, but there are also comments about the international order being more challenging, more turbulent, uh, marked by more unrest. Um, the previous statements that had been made um, in past party congresses to the effect that peace and development is the major uh, feature of the age and that China faces a strategic opportunity for development, those, those words, peace and development, strategic opportunity, are still in the party Congress political report, and they're still mentioned several times. But in each case, they are qualified now more than they had been in the past, qualified by indications, as I just said, of greater turbulence, greater challenge, greater efforts to contain China, these are obviously references to the United States in many respects. Um, and so it's a very explicit recognition that even though peace and development still is the main direction, it's now undergoing lots and lots of uh, disruptions. And that means China has to be more assertive in defending uh, what it defines as peace and development and taking advantage of this period of strategic opportunity. So it's a mix. It's a combination of some continuity but with a very clear message that uh, China has got to really be much more careful and much more assertive, much more deliberate in preventing uh, the different actions being taken by the US and others that they see as threatening uh, these objectives and threatening China specifically. Uh, before I turn to you, Jake, I just wanted to mention for those listening, 
and watching. Uh, if you have a question for either Jake or Michael, please put it in the Q&A and we'll be sifting through those probably um, closer to in the second half of our hour together. Uh, Jake, would you like to follow up on, on that question? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I, I agree with uh, what Michael says. Um, we, we see a lot of continuity here. We see no indications um, that uh, the Chinese government is uh, kind of moving in a, in a warlike direction or uh, intends a more aggressive foreign policy posture. Um, I think it is, it is really worth emphasizing. You know, the, the view that we have of these sorts of events from the United States tends to focus on this question of how does it affect U.S. foreign policy or, or how does it affect Chinese foreign policy. I think it's, it's worth emphasizing here that that is not the focus, that was not the focus of Xi, Xi Jinping's work report that he gave at the beginning of the Congress. Um, the, the kinds of discussions that happen at the Congress uh, are, are largely focused on domestic politics. Now, foreign policy, of course, increasingly is intertwined with those two as, as nationalism gets stronger in China and as the perceived threat from, from foreign actors, in particular the United States, gets stronger in China, then, then domestic and, and foreign policy become more and more intertwined. But it, it is worth emphasizing that the, the focus of the report, the, the place that it starts, and the most important question for any Chinese ruler is what's going on in the economy. Um, and if the economy can't maintain some degree of stable growth, then uh, that, that is uh, considered the most challenging, the most threatening um, security issue for the Chinese leadership. And that, that remains um, at the center of, uh, of the Chinese leadership's concerns. And I think that that has, an important, has important consequences for uh, Chinese foreign policy, um, uh, despite uh, increasingly aggressive rhetorical stance, um, which is often called wolf warrior diplomacy, uh, coming from the Chinese foreign ministry um, and from various, uh, various embassies around the world. Um, uh, even, even despite this much more aggressive rhetorical posture, the, the actual practical steps that China is taking in its foreign policy remain calibrated, they remain um, uh, relatively cautious, um, and, and we see no indications uh, that that has changed. And an important part of that is that uh, the, the leadership, I think, believes very clearly that uh, disruption to the international order will threaten China's economic basis. Um, I think that's a, that's a correct judgment. Um, and, it, and even though you know, the, the perception within China is that the disruptions are all coming from outside, uh, of course, there's no there's no assumption, uh, there's no sort of introspection about what China, China's action might have played in the deterioration of, uh, of global stability. Um, uh, but nonetheless, I think there is a clear desire to maintain that stability if it can be done on terms that are acceptable um, to China. Uh, we talked a little bit about the consolidation of power. Uh, Jake, you mentioned that there were a flurry of analyses after uh, this weekend talking about she as being the strongest leader since Mao Zedong with every rival expunged from the Pol Politburo Standing Committee. Lots of analysis on why, on, on, on why and what that might mean. Michael, but was this a little bit overstated? Um, do we see any limits to his power in this context? And what, uh, in, in, in the party Congress, what we saw come out of it, um, but inherently, are there limits to his power? Well, we certainly, in terms of personnel changes, we certainly saw very few, if any, indications of what you would call limitations on Xi Jinping's power. Um, as Jake mentioned, the people who've been selected now for the standing committee, <clears throat> the most important body, are all in one way or another uh, people who have either come up under Xi Jinping or have been closely identified with Xi Jinping's views. Um, and in some respects, they're really people who are more seen as political uh, figures in the sense of supporting party directives and party actions than they are as technocrats or bureaucrats, if you will. Whereas in the past, you would see, I mean, all these people are loyal to the party, of course, that's a given. But in the past, you've seen people placed in these very high positions who have had a lot of functional expertise in certain areas of the system. And they then went on as Politburo Standing Committee members to lead those systems within the Chinese overall Chinese government uh, and the party structure. 
that kind of a, of a functional division is now giving way to one that is more closely associated with uh, political ideological support for Xi and um, staffers, really, if you will. Uh, it's probably most likely the case that the premier position is going to be held by an individual, Li Chang, who is more of a real sort of staffer than he is of an independent uh, government actor. Um, and he has very little, if any, experience in the state council, per se. So that all indicates that there's very little there that's going uh, to qualify. Now, from a broader perspective, of course, uh, Xi Jinping is not omnipotent. Uh, Xi Jinping does not have absolute control regardless of what might happen in China. I mean, no Chinese leader has held that. I suppose Mao Zedong has been the closest to that figure who had independent charisma and an independent revolutionary pedigree that really made him to certain degrees un un unassailable. And so he was able to carry out something like the Cultural Revolution, which was an explicit attack on elements of the party itself. And he basically stood outside the party <clears throat> and was able to conduct that. Xi Jinping does not have that level of power and charisma in the system. He is still, even though he's a princeling, he's the son of a, of a revolutionary generation father, um, he is very much an individual who must succeed by virtue of his success in policy, as well as by the a level of support he gets from his colleagues. And you know, both of those things you cannot assume were going to be inevitable and, and always going on. If he encounters major problems in policy that really are damaging to China, that seem to be very much wedded with him, then you could very well see fractures beginning to emerge uh, in the Chinese system, and, and Xi's position could very well become you know, somewhat questionable. But we're not in that situation at this point. We could get there with his policies, but uh, we're not there yet. I have a, a, a two-finger follow-up on that, if you will. What you mentioned that he he doesn't have a wealth of, of charisma, but what does he have in his toolbox that has enabled him to consolidate power in this extraordinary way that perhaps his his um, you know the his, the previous politicians and chairmen have not had? Well, I think previous chairmen and politicians have had a lot of the kind of tools of power that he has today. I think the big difference here, as I see it, uh, Jake may disagree, is that Xi Jinping was brought into office based upon a general consensus within the senior leadership that they needed to have somebody at that time relatively young uh, somebody who had a pedigree, close association with the party, uh, somebody who was not uh, a chaos-producing Maoist type, as Jake says, and somebody who was very attuned to dealing with the problems that the party was experiencing at the time. Um, and that includes massive amounts of corruption. Uh, that includes a lot of different types of directions of movement of interest groups in China, economic, technological and others, lots and lots of influence from the outside, Western influence, et cetera, all of which were being seen to be destabilizing China's order and stability. And of course, they had the backdrop of the collapse of the Soviet Union, the color revolutions, all of that. Xi Jinping was brought in to redress those problems. And he has, he has indeed sought to do so, major anti-corruption campaign, et cetera. So he had a lot of if you will, uh, consent, if not goodwill, behind him from the party leadership going in. And he sought to play on that. And he used that uh, goodwill and, and suspension of judgment, if you will, um, to uh, build his power base, to use the corruption campaign, to also remove some of his major political, potential political rivals, to use his top position, uh, to try to strengthen and define his role as one of not just the general secretary of the party, but as a major core of the party leadership and as a new ideological light for the, for the party, for the party's ideology. Um, so he's done all of that. 
with support of some of his closest supporters who are very good within the propaganda sphere and the organization sphere in order to strengthen his position. And he's been very, he's been very systematic about it. And in general, he's been uh, very effective at it. And so uh, unlike Hu Jintao, his predecessor, who really was not nearly as active in this regard, who sought to, to maintain a collective leadership with decisions among all the senior leaders on the major policy issues, and he was kind of first among equals. In Xi Jinping's case, he's first. Um, and the others are definitely second rank and largely in support of him. And he's been able to do that because he's been able to hold and grab the key levers of power and use ideology and organization to strengthen his position. Thank you, Michael. This is why we have a panel like this and have you and Jake on here because I did not see any of that in-depth analysis and in any of the coverage of the party Congress. So thank you very much for answering that question. So I know a lot of people are on this call. They wanna hear about Taiwan. Uh, last week in the public remarks made by uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken at the Hoover Institution, uh, he said the following in reaction to the party Congress after its opening, quote, instead of sticking with the status quo that was established in a positive way, Beijing has made a fundamental decision that the status quo is no longer acceptable and Beijing is determined to pursue reunification with Taiwan on a much faster timeline. Um, I don't know who wants to answer this first, um, but what do you make of the secretary's comments and do they match your own takeaways from what we saw at the party congress last week? And Jake, why don't you take this? It's your turn. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I think, um, I suspect that the, 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 uh, the remarks from the secretary of state were a little off the cuff and, and, and uh, it would have been a strange venue to announce what, uh, if you just read quite literally what he says, would be a major shift in the US government's understanding of, of China's intentions around Taiwan. So I suspect there was just uh, some, some uh, I, I think, I th this is sort of speculative, but, but what, what makes sense to me based on my understanding of this issue um, and the fact that it wasn't, it, it, you know, like it wasn't the place you would expect a major policy reversal or revision coming from the Secretary of State, um, is that uh, it, it, it certainly is the case that the Chinese government, Chinese leadership, um, has become more anxious about the, the Taiwan issue, um, has increasingly, uh, increasingly defined progress on progress towards unification between the mainland and Taiwan as an important priority. Um, they seem to be less, less willing to put this off indefinitely. Um, I think it, one thing that uh, Blinken, I think, failed to do was, was engage in a little bit of introspection about how the US posture may have contributed to this change. But it, it is certainly also true that internal developments in China have led to strengthening nationalism. Um, and uh, there's sort of a, a, a package of uh, changes within China that, that, that Michael referred to. Um, the growing sort of need for centralization, uh, increasingly authoritarian approach to politics, increasing intolerance of dissent, um, uh, increasing uh, kind of uh, push for cultural homogeneity, for uh, ideological discipline within the party and, with, and in society. Um, all of th these things sort of are, are linked to each other, reinforce each other. Um, <clears throat> one thing I think and one that's important to note here is that this is not specific to the Chinese Communist Party or to China. Um, there has been a shift in this direction in countries around the world, including in the United States. Uh, and so I, I think it's important to examine, to not, as, as Secretary of State Blinken did in, in his comments there, to simply say China has changed its orientation on this stuff and it, and it should change it back. Um, we, we should try to understand the forces that have, that have led to these shifts such as they are um, and that increasingly are building tension between the US, very extremely dangerous tensions between the US and China around Taiwan, um, rather than uh, simply laying blame and thereby uh, reinforcing those tensions. But, but I, I'd like Michael to, to sort of add on to the, the uh, Taiwan specifically. Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Jake. I, I, I basically agree with, with what Jake just said. I would just 
I mean, I'd, I'd add a few things. I think he's right. It's probably an extemporaneous comment by Secretary Blinken, but it's not, it's not that atypical. I mean, it's reflecting a general sense that has been uh, expressed time and time again by Biden administration leaders that um, ch China is changing the status quo and that China is, uh, because it's much more concerned about ta Taiwan, it's, it's, it's possibly now preparing to use force. Um, reconsidering, if not given up, its commitment to peaceful unification, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> those kinds of views, I think, are not supported by evidence. Um, I think that uh, in this regard, the change status quo and all the rest of it, uh, Secretary Blinken is providing sort of alarmist characterizations of Chinese actions and motives without really providing much in the way of evidence. Um, Beijing has not suddenly decided that the status quo is no longer acceptable. It has held some positions that are largely incompatible with the, those of the United States for many years. <clears throat> Pardon me, such as with regard to U.S. power in Asia, uh, U.S. dominance over certain global norms. But it's also supported many elements of the status quo, what we would think of as the status quo in the international community regarding the core principles of certain uh, principles laid out in the UN Charter regarding sovereignty, uh, the norms of many international regimes on WMD proliferation, health issues, global finance. Uh, the Chinese are not this cross the board uh, rejecter of the status quo. They are a qualified supporter of the status quo, as is the United States, I should say. Um, but there are real differences between how the US and how China define the status quo. Now, on the question of a timeline for Taiwan, um, Blinken has made this comment and others have sort of alluded to it. I see no evidence in the public domain that the Chinese have conclusively altered or accelerated a timeline for uh, reunifying with Taiwan, which would have to be by force because an accelerated timeline, you're not gonna get a peaceful unification under current conditions. And so basically that argument comes down to the Chinese are now preparing to use force soon. And, and there's just absolutely no clear evidence for this in the documentary record. Now, if there's some evidence for it in the classified record that uh, Secretary Blinken is referring to, then by all means, he should indicate that, that there is something in the classified record that indicates this. And if possible, he should indicate what that might be, um, although he probably couldn't. But you know, it's this kind of game of making these elliptical vague references uh, by U.S. officials to these certain very consequential points that I find most troublesome. Um, they need to be much more specific, provide much more evidence, and they haven't, and they've been very contradictory um, in, in certain ways in talking about Taiwan and what Taiwan means for the United States in, in the Western Pacific. Um, so I think there needs to be more consistency. I think there needs to be a real recognition that, as Jake says, both sides are contributing to the tensions and the problems we now see over Taiwan. Um, the, the United States is not uh, a choir boy on this score. The United States has been gradually hollowing out the one China policy despite saying otherwise. It's been taking actions that have reduced the credibility of that policy, particularly in the eyes of the Chinese, but also in the eyes of others. Um, and, it, and it really uh, needs to reassess what it's doing in that regard. And similarly, the Chinese have been doing things that really call into question their commitments to peaceful unification as a top priority. They'll never renounce the possibility of use of force because they see that as the right of a sovereign nation over its own territory, which is what they view Taiwan as being. But nonetheless, the Chinese have taken actions that look like they're more inclined to use force in some ways without explicitly saying so and without explicitly having a timetable for doing so. Both countries need to recognize how they are both contributing to this dynamic, and neither is doing that. Both of them point fingers at the other side. Each of them stands there as if they're blameless, and the other side needs to change in order to alter the situation. And that, I think, is a, a guarantee for more trouble, more confrontation. Yeah. Well, let's just stay with foreign policy um, for one more question. I'm going to take this question from the Q&A. Zachary Pakin, who uh, is to for peace and diplomacy, has an excellent question for both of you. Um, he says, with Xi having consolidated even more power at home, will he now be more willing to risk the political capital 
that he is invested in his partnership with Russia and twist Vladimir Putin's arm to bring an end to the war in Ukraine? Or will we have to wait until after the National People's Congress for that? At what point does the continuation of the Ukraine war represent an unacceptable threat to the Chinese economy and Chinese security? Jake, me? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's unlikely that, that Xi Jinping is going to, to change uh, tack on Ukraine uh, unless something else changes. So this sort of gets to a dynamic that Michael is talking about um, because the, the China-Russia relationship has everything to do with the, the China-US relationship. Um, the, the, reason that, um, the reason that China was willing to, to uh, really flagrant, flagrantly violate its own principle of respecting territorial integrity and national sovereignty, this is, this is the absolute basis of, of sort of Chinese foreign policy principles. So to, uh, to fail to come out against the invasion of Ukraine um, is, is really a, a violation of, of the, the basic tenets of China's proclaimed foreign policy, um, which, which is not unusual if uh, great powers violate their, their proclaimed tenets all the time. Um, but, um, but the reason I think, China, China is actually very careful about these sorts of things generally. Um, and, and, and pretty consistent on it. The, the reason that it, it went in a very different direction around Ukraine is that China sees in its own situation facing pressure from the United States and its allies, it sees itself in Russia's situation. It sees the, the, the sense of a, a weaker power being pressured by, uh, by the rich countries. Um, there's, there's another layer on, on this where uh, the memory of, of Western imperialism in Asia is is really strong and vital to China's own the Chinese leadership's own self conception of their historical mission and the kinds of threats that China is facing. So it's also a question of uh, <clears throat> sort of a, a historical memory about imperialism, about the Cold War, um, about the, the history of containment that was focused against the Soviet Union and China. The sense that um, the in order to advance the goals of the leadership, which is the prosperity of the Chinese people, the restoration of, of uh, China's territorial integrity around the Taiwan issue in particular, um, in order to achieve uh, these, these goals are not going to be achievable as long as, um, as, long as the, the rich countries, the former imperialist powers continue to, uh, to pressure us. And they see, they see themselves in, in Russia. So now, the, as, as you mentioned, I, I just have, uh, a long article out in the nation where I unpack some of this and, and, and try to demonstrate the really deep differences between the two countries. But increasingly, um, the sense of a dangerous international order, uh, the sense that uh, the United States will not tolerate the rise of China, um, the sense that, uh, that the, the global system is moving towards zero-sum competition, even though the leadership does not want that, and I'm setting aside the ways in which Chinese leadership contributes to this because, again, they, they are, have a hard time understanding their own role in this. But they, they don't want, um, the Chinese leadership does not want a zero-sum global system. And that's the direction it's moving in, uh, thanks to the actions of both the United States and China. Um, uh, in that context, then, they, uh, the Chinese leadership increasingly comes to, to resemble the Russian leadership. Um, and they see their interests as aligned. So I, I think as long as, and, and the Biden administration is only turning the screws tighter on China, is not, is not demonstrating to China that there's another path. Um, the Biden administration and, and American political leaders in general, um, they, they, their orientation towards every goal that China articulates is to say this is, uh, this is um, contributing to the erosion of the rules-based international order. This is contrary, this is undermining democracy. Um, this this must be this must be turned back. Um, that that is the perspective that American leaders have on all of the goals that, that China has set for itself. And in that context, no, I don't I don't think there's going to be a change uh, in the in the orientation towards Russia. Even aside from the fact that Xi Jinping drove the, the alignment with Russia in the first place, and and he's putting his own credibility on the line. But I think this this larger constellation of of the sense of uh, facing the hostility of the United States and the other rich countries um, is really determinative and really and is really going to constrict any possible imagination of, of alternatives unless it were to change in some way. Yeah. Michael? If I could just add a word, I mean, I, I, I agree with, with, what, with what Jake has just said. Um, 
I think that there is a, you, you can say that the, the Chinese certainly are not going to take actions which are clearly designed to sort of ally themselves with the West and, and NATO and against Russia on Ukraine. Um, but they are going to resist taking active steps to support Russia um, in ways that would really provoke a confrontation with the United States and the West. They've done that thus far. They, they have not um, tried to evade the sanctions regime. They have not provided um, significant military assistance to Russia. Um, they have, in their some of their rhetoric, qualified the, their level of support for Russia. And I could see a situation where if Putin becomes even more risk acceptant, and if he takes even more uh, violent actions, um, including, uh, God forbid, the use of a tactical nuclear weapon, I don't think that's high, very likely, but if he were to do that, I think that would shock the Chinese. And I think it would, it would certainly not precipitate or, or motivate them to sort of stand behind Russia full-throatedly defending what Putin is doing. So there's room for the Chinese to move further away from Russia without rejecting their relationship with Russia and certainly without aligning themselves fully with the United States or the West. So I think that's, that's one issue. One other point I would make is that although I share uh, uh, Jake's view of what the Biden administration's assessment is of China, I think in recent weeks, uh, the Biden administration, particularly Secretary Blinken, have tried to message that we're really not into just zero sum competition with China. We are not just out to destroy China. We don't want a Cold War. We don't want this. We don't want that. And they've, and they've expressed that view more pointedly in recent weeks, I think, because of the kind of criticisms that they're getting about their excessive, you know, zero sum nature of their approach to China. But at the same time, you know, the United States is doing things like passing legislation now uh, in the high tech area that is explicitly designed not just to prohibit some clearly military related technologies from going from the West to China, but to prevent China from becoming a high tech, uh, advanced high tech nation as a whole. Um, and if you're taking those kinds of more sledgehammer like actions, while at the same time saying, hey, we don't want a Cold War, we really want to work with China in a lot of areas, it's hard to square those two trajectories, in my mind, for the United States. Well, and, and that segues nicely into my next question uh, for Jake. Uh, let's, let's look at more of the trade and economic issues to come out of the party Congress, if any. Jake, your focus has been on trade and economic competition between the U.S. and China. Lately, the discussion has been dominated by moves to cut off the sale of advanced microchips to China and longer range strategies to make the US less dependent on Chinese supply lines. COVID and the ensuing inflation has only exacerbated this talk. Um, were there any clues that we could take from the party Congress about the future of US-China competition and how China views some of these moves that Washington has made or is making? Um, yes. Um, so first, I want to I want to say that I agree with what Michael said. That it's worth noting that on the China Russia question, that China does seem to be even in public uh, applying a little bit of pressure on Russia at the, for example, at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting um, recently. Uh, there there was a public admission that there was you know tension disagreement between the two countries. So it's so. I, I, I thank, thanks, thank you to Michael for sort of nuancing my, my, my more general comments. Um, on, on the semiconductor issue and the, the, the emergence of what I think we should increasingly understand as, as a kind of, of limited economic warfare uh, between China, it's, it is very limited. And, and, I, and I want to kind of pull apart the thinking here um, from the perspective, I think from the perspective of the Biden administration, what they're doing around these export controls and the and, and presumably we're going to have sort of a series of additional measures that strengthen um, the other other routes by which the U.S. expertise, U.S. intellectual property, U.S. business could theoretically strengthen Chinese power. Um, 
uh, I think from the perspective of the Biden administration, they uh, are thinking they're doing something very targeted. So they keep saying that it's a tailored measure. If, for example, the, the export controls that came out of the uh, Commerce Department um, that, that essentially put a stop to any Chinese access to uh, advanced semiconductors and, and super computer technology, um, uh, those, those only applied to the really cutting edge, the bleeding edge of the highest tech um, semiconductors that are out there. Um, so from the, from, I think from the perspective of the Biden administration, you know, they, they, they didn't, they didn't take sort of the nuclear option and cut off all Chinese access to, to semiconductors, which would have, which, which would have devastated a far wider range of Chinese companies could have really hurt, say the auto industry, like these, these massive consequential sectors of the economy could have been really seriously damaged. And I think the Biden administration looks at that and says, you know, we're, we're exercising restraint here. We're only focusing at the really top end. And, and the point, the point of that is, uh, as, as Jake Sullivan said, um, is, is to make sure that the United States always is ahead in the highest technology um, parts of, of the economy. Um, and that, and, and they say that this is about, uh, about the military, about making sure that the, the People's Liberation Army is not in a position to, to be able to um, defeat the United States. Um, the, prob the problem with this is that it doesn't look that way from, from the Chinese leadership. So assuming the Biden, that that's what is sort of going on in, in Biden administration thinking, that is, that is not how it appears in Beijing um, because the, the great example is that the Commerce Department export controls um, these apply to a very small segment of microchips, but they are the strategically absolutely essential um, uh, part of the market for future technology, for uh, sort of the, the, the high value, most advanced parts of the economy. It, it's not the, the, the military applications are there, but, um, but there's a far, far wider range of commercial applications and if the Biden administration succeeds in preventing China from accessing these sorts of chips, then that basically prevents China from continuing to move up the, the value chain uh, in, in its economy. And going back to my earlier comments that, that development is absolutely essential to the thinking of the, the Chinese leadership, um, there, there's a, a really serious problem with youth unemployment in China right now. There has been a huge production of highly educated Chinese youth who are unable to get the kinds, the kinds of uh, high pay, high status jobs that, that they expect after coming through that. And, and the party is really worried about that. It's, it's worried that there's going to be serious social unrest if they can't sustain growth, if they can't continue to create the jobs um, in these high value sectors, if they can't continue to maintain profitability in Chinese business. These are real concerns for the Chinese leadership. And the Biden administration is throwing a hand grenade right in the middle of those concerns and saying like, too bad. You know, we're, and so that is going to be interpreted in Beijing as fundamentally unfair, like taking a knife and cutting your and cutting your opponents, cutting your cutting your competitors' legs rather than than fighting fair. Um, but but more important, as as an existential threat to the future of the Chinese economy. So I think that I think that you know both of these perspectives maybe make sense. Um, but uh, but the the consequences that the Biden administration may be expecting here. Um, um, uh, I, I think they, they may underestimate the, 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 the explosiveness of these kinds of steps that threaten to permanently subordinate um, China, again, to the countries that sort of the historically imperialist powers, the, the countries that, that have always tried to contain China, that, have, that, that, that occupied and dominated China for 100 years of humiliation, right? Like this, this resonates in the practical concerns of the leadership, like how am I gonna maintain uh, economic growth and social stability, and it also resonates in the in the concerns around um, a sense of national status and pride, um, and both of those things are going to 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 um, to, to to leave uh, is going to really deepen the, the already sort of the sense that we we can't both we can't both succeed. China and the United States can't both can't coexist and succeed because because we are stuck in this this frame of zero sum, increasingly understood as existential competition. That's extremely dangerous. So we talked, oh, did you want to say something, Michael? Well, I was just going to say one, one very slight addition to what Jake just said, which I entirely agree with, is that I don't, it's not just that the Chinese leadership perceive this this way. I think probably most ordinary Chinese do. Most ordinary Chinese look at what the United States is doing here and, and say, 
and, and, and draw a conclusion that the United States really does want to stop China from developing. And, and that really is feeding more and more of these attitudes within China that they're looking at a zero sum threat from, from the United States. The United States is not just about opposing the Chinese Communist Party, it's about keeping China down as a developing country. So we've talked a lot about Xi. Can we talk a little bit about the party? And I know we only have about 10 minutes left, but the health of the party um, and its role in Chinese society and economic development. Michael, can you talk about the role of the party and its control over society and the people and whether you see this expanding further or shrinking after this convocation? Oh, I think it's very much going to be the case that the role of the party will continue to be major and likely increase. I mean, Xi Jinping's rule thus far, if, if, if I had to characterize it with a very short sentence or so, I would say it is a commitment to purifying the party, strengthening the party's control over society, and um, improving the ideology um, of the party. So anti-corruption, ideological rigor, party influence and control. Uh, Xi Jinping has a very Leninist perception towards rule in China. And so the question will be not, will the party continue to be important? It's in what ways will the party grow and influence uh, society and the economy um, in China and will this serve the interests of the Chinese nation and the Chinese people? Um, it's, it, I think it does so in some respects, in the sense of preserving order and some level of you know, stability in a very fluid international environment and a very fluid international economic environment um, where there's all kinds of forces that impact China. Um, so there is a certain functionality to the party's strength and leadership in terms of preserving order but it can go way too far and it can be used in ways that really inhibit and stifle uh, exchange of information, innovation, free thinking, debate within China about what the future long-term role of China should be in the international system. You had those kinds of discussions, albeit still within party containment, you had those kinds of discussions in China in the 1980s uh, before the Tiananmen massacre in 1989. Um, but you've had far few of them since and almost none under Xi Jinping. And I think that kind of suppression um, by the party is going to continue. I think it's in many ways setting China back. It's undermining China's ability to adapt and modify um, in, you know, to the modern world in the 21st century. Um, and it's not gonna, it's not gonna be, uh, place China in a good position over time. So I, I'm hoping that these, some of these major principles of party control that Xi Jinping has laid out and, and his own views and ideology, et cetera, will over time be shown to be um, unsuccessful in ways that do lead to moderation of them and lead to greater amounts of discussion over time in China. And on that note, uh, Jake, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A, one from uh, Subain Abdi, sorry if I um, butchered your name, but also Kenneth Fong, who ra ra raised the question of what seems to be Xi's pro proclivity of putting his friends and, and trusted associates ahead of those who may have experience in the policies that, um, that they are um, you know, uh, in charge of. And at what point, and we, and we had a, a president, our last president was known to be putting friends and confidants and in, in, in serious top level positions over those who might have had more government experience because he felt like he needed to keep them close and that they had served him better. But at what point do we see um, perhaps a tipping point in which we have too many yes men um, in, in government and in, in, in this close inner circle and not enough um, no men or uh, people with experience that would actually um, promote and push and, and exactly the, the types of policies that China needs right now? Uh, you know, I think it's, 
I think the discussion of this in um, in the U.S. media amongst commentators is, can can get simplified in in unhelpful ways. Um, uh, there's there's a general tendency to say that uh, like greater centralization is the same as greater authoritarianism, and both of them are are going to lead to bad outcomes. Um, I, I think that really that really neglects first of all the the reason for the centralization in the first place, which is something that, that Michael touched upon, that the, the, the state that the country was in um, when Xi Jinping took power uh, was, by the estimation of, of the party leadership, was, was, was really quite dire. Like the party was losing legitimacy, uh, corrupt, corruption was running rampant, uh, there were severe economic problems, the, the economy was being driven by a bubble in the property market uh, after the, the Western export markets had really declined after following the 2008 crisis. Um, you can actually, if you just read Xi Jinping's report, he, he re reviews all of all of this history um, in abbreviated form. He, he explains sort of why it is that he has had to centralize power, um, and and the need to centralize power is partially to to impose discipline on the party, to put an end to corruption. Um, it's partly also to break through the fragmented political landscape, and I think this can be hard for uh, in, in democratic systems to understand. Um, but the, the, the state prior to Xi was not centralized. It was authoritarian, but not centralized. Um, it was a highly fragmented state that was difficult uh, to drive significant systemic reforms through. And so the, the impetus for a lot of what's going on under Xi is to, uh, to overcome that fragmentation in order to make fundamental reforms. So the, I, think, I think we should distinguish clearly between uh, the centralization, centralization that I think um, is is needed to a certain extent in China and and actually in countries around the world that that we see parallel problems with. There's a high degree of fragmentation that is that is defeating reform in countries around the world. Um, so we should distinguish between that as sort of um, uh, as 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 a condition that is required after a, a period of increasing fragmentation and inequality and corruption. And this is true around the world again. Um, we should distinguish between that and then the the policy, the policies that are taken, the reforms that are pursued to to tackle those problems. Um, and I, I think the the place that I would point to the to where uh, Xi Xi Jinping is going wrong is um, <clears throat> the the increasingly the the in, in increasing sort of desire to regiment the population um, in order to make the nation competitive in global competition, whether that's economic or whether that's military competition. Um, I, th I think that this is, I, I mean, that, uh, that deeply offends my, my kind of political ethics, but, but it, it also, I think, drives the dynamics that they imagine that they're responding to um, even deeper. So there's a response to the sense of being besieged that makes that siege even stronger. And I think you see a similar set of dynamics on the US side where every, the steps that people are taking to respond to uh, the, the serious social problems and the, the, the sort of serious um, uh, difficulties with the economy and, and with um, international competition, the steps that people are taking to that deepen the crisis rather than resolve it. And I think the Chinese leadership is contributing to that by based on the policies that it's pursuing, um, as as are the other great powers. Um, so I so you know I. <laughs> We we at the Quincy Institute are advocating a little bit um, a little bit of introspection on all sides and a different general approach to these issues so that we can stop this sort of downward spiral. Um, but it, it, I, I do want to sort of emphasize that that um, just saying Xi Jinping is uh, is an autocrat is an inadequate analysis of what's going on here. Well, we have uh, one minute left, so I'm going to give you a lightning round question. Um, we, we've talked a lot about the mainstream coverage of the party Congress. Can each of you tell me one thing that, that came out of this Congress that you feel that, uh, the American people or listeners in general just don't know about this Congress, what came out of it, what messages or, um, any other news, uh, that, that should be, uh, better reported. Michael. Yeah. I mean, if I had to point to one thing just off the top of my head, I would sort of refer to something that, that Jake alluded to, and I guess I did too in, in some respects, and that is that even though this party Congress anointed Xi Jinping as the clear, unambiguous leader of China, 
it did not clearly anoint a set of policies and policy directions that showed that China is committed to a much more aggressive line of policy in the future under Xi Jinping. Um, I think it will see China doing what it thinks is standing and defending its interests, especially on sovereignty questions like Taiwan, South China Sea, East China Sea. Yes, we'll get a continuation there, but it's not given a lot of evidence to the people who have said, oh, you know, Xi Jinping is about to attack Taiwan. Xi Jinping is about to really provoke relations with the West in ways that really lead us to a real confrontation. Um, as she, Jake said, the Chinese leadership <clears throat> within certain realms in certain ways is still a cautious leadership. And it still moves on many issues with a certain level of restraint um, compared to what they might otherwise be and what some people predict that they are or will be. And I think that is something that Americans should recognize. China is a concern for sure. China is doing things that challenge some American interests for sure. But China also is, is moving in some ways cautiously, and it, it, I think, is possibly open to efforts by the United States to try to move cautiously to test the proposition as to whether or not we can get out of this mutually destructive cycle with this interactive dynamic that we've now been in for many, many years where both sides just assume the worst about the other and, and proceed accordingly. I think there is an opening for trying to improve that relationship by undermining that dynamic. Jake? Um, I, I guess I would, I would point to maybe um, one of the features I think one of the least productive features of some of the commentary on Chinese politics in general, um, which is to characterize uh, Xi Jinping as being driven by ideology in contrast to his uh, pragmatic predecessors. And that generally lines up with, um, with another set of binaries, uh, ideological versus pragmatic, uh, authoritarian versus uh, less authoritarian, um, state versus society, bureaucracy versus the market. I think all of these binaries are really unhelpful. Um, the, and they don't reflect the fact that the world has really changed in, in deep ways uh, over the last 15 years. Um, uh, the Chinese leadership is struggling with those changes. Uh, they don't, I don't, I don't think they have a plan. There's, there's, there's a, a sort of a general feeling amongst a lot of American commentators that there's sort of a a hundred year plan that's unfolding. Um, I, I don't think they have a plan. I think they're actually just like normal political leaders around the world. They sort of respond where they see opportunities. Um, they, they, they respond to things that they see as threats. Uh, they respond to their anxieties, given the instability that they find themselves within. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I think that does, that does kind of shape a, a sort of rough and ready ideology that is grappling with the problems that, that they face. It's often, I think, an unconstructive or reactionary ideology. Um, but, but I think rather than imagining that we are outside of ideology and they are under the, the sway of dogma or something, um, I, think, I think the same thing is happening just to, 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 to a great extent on both sides, is that political leaders in the United States are also sort of grappling in a rough and ready way with a set of values and, and, and trying to, to navigate really treacherous political cur currents inside the country and in, in the global economy. And between the relation within the relations between the great powers, um, uh, I think we should we should we should resist setting up the Chinese leadership as this like alien, fundamentally different set of actors uh, that that we cannot really understand or sympathize with, and really try to understand where they're coming from um, and the pressures that they're under, even when we even when we really really sharply disagree. Um, with, the, with the outcomes or with some of the values that are driving these things. Um, we should try to understand these, these people as political actors, just like they're political actors in all countries. Um, and, that's gonna, and that's gonna ultimately is going to give us a better understanding of what's going on in China and is going to lead to a better set of policies that in the end, I think will, will help people on all sides. Well, let's, let's hope that better understanding prevails. Thank you so much, Jake and, and Michael, for this really compelling high-level discussion about the Party Congress. Before uh, everyone 
leaves us, I just wanted to mention that we have another panel tomorrow, uh, October 25th, Tuesday, uh, at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Foreign Funding and Public Trust in the Think Tank Center. This is going to be a uh, sector, rather, this is going to be a discussion about earning back the public trust and what Congress is considering doing to increase transparency and reduce corruption at think tanks. This is going to include QI's Eli Clifton, Katie Murray, Nicholas Robinson, and moderated by Ben Freeman. Again, that's tomorrow uh, at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Check uh, the link out at quincyinst.org, as well as all the great work that Michael and Jake have done on uh, the East Asia issue, particularly on China. And thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.